بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته No one on earth is exempted from being responsible Sometimes we feel that life is so easy I have no worries I have no responsibilities I can live my life to the fullest and this is a wrong understanding this is a wrong conviction because every single person living on earth is held accountable is responsible whether he's a professional or non-professional the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says and the hadith is in al-Bukhari and Muslim which grazes it at the top in authenticity the Prophet says alayhi salatu wa sallam each of you is a shepherd and each of you is responsible of his flock the Amir the ruler the person who is the leader he is responsible and he is the shepherd for his flock a man is the shepherd of the members of his household and he is responsible for them a woman is the shepherd of her husband's house and children and is responsible for them therefore a proper Muslim has the responsibility in front of him all the time because he knows he is responsible and he will be questioned about his acts about his conviction about what he believes and it is not something to be taken lightly it is a heavy burden and this is what calls a Muslim to be perfect this is what calls us to be on the straight path that leads to Jannah because eventually if we are not we're going to hell and among the most important responsibilities of a Muslim professional as we discussed yesterday is to know what is the cause of your existence why are you in this life why did Allah create you out of accident definitely not you were created for a purpose some of the agnostic some of the atheists who say that there is no God there is no Allah and we were created by chance you ask them is there a wisdom behind your creation they would say no there are people like this if you ask them the shoes in your feet the shoes that you wore wearing on your feet do they have wisdom and he says yes they protect me from heat they protect me from broken glass they protect my feet so we ask them your shoes have wisdom and you created in this world without any wisdom then your shoes are better than you because they have a purpose and you don't so it is essential it is your responsibility to know why Allah created you what does he want from us because you have a very limited time in this life he created you to worship him and to worship him is to do everything that he loves whether you by rhetoric by saying it or by acting upon it or by believing in it in your heart once you do this you are worshiping Allah the Almighty on top of a Muslim's responsibility whether he's Muslim whether he's a professional or non-professional 
is that you know that you have to be one of those da'is. You have to be a caller to Islam. This is your responsibility. And you don't have an excuse not to call people to Islam. Because Allah says in the Quran, and who is better in speech than he who invites to Allah and does righteous deeds and says, I am one of the Muslims. So it is an obligation upon every Muslim professional to call for the way of Allah. The ayah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا It's in Arabic. It translates to, there is no one better in speech. There is no one better in rhetoric than he who invites to Allah Azza wa Jal, who calls people to Allah the Almighty. So it is your responsibility to call for Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is not your role and job. This is the role of prophets, the role of messengers, the role of scholars, and the role of da'is throughout time. They all call for Allah the Almighty. Now, one of the things that may depress you sometimes, and that may hinder your da'wah is a misconception. People think of quantity more than they think of quality. And this is a very big problem. You can pray 10,000 rak'ah per day and Allah will not accept one single rak'ah. But if you pray two rak'ahs, as in the hadith of Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him. And you contemplate and you concentrate and you make it solely for Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will forgive all of your previous sins with two rak'ahs only. So a lot of the people, when they see that they are giving da'wah and no one is following them, they think that it is inappropriate to make da'wah anymore. And this is wrong. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah showed me the nations and I saw great nations with great followers and I saw a prophet with great people following him and I saw a prophet with few people following him and I saw a prophet with only a man or two and I saw a prophet and no one was following him he can there be anyone better than a prophet in da'wah yet this prophet no one followed him. So it is not a criteria of success that so many people follow you. This is not the case. There can be one or two followers and accepting, accepting your da'wah and Allah loves you. And there can be hundreds of thousands of people following you and Allah does not love you. It depends on what you're calling the people to. As a Muslim As a professional, professional, you can call you can people call through different, different ways, ways to Allah Azza wa Jal. You can use the teaching and the rhetoric methodology like I do. But sometimes this is not possible because I don't expect all of you to become orators or da'is. Because then we would have a problem. I would not have a job. So let this for me at the moment. But you're invited if you have the ability to become a da'i or an orator, alhamdulillah. This is one aspect. Yet the aspect that every one of you can do and can succeed in doing da'wah through is the best way of da'wah. And that is by your actions, by your conduct. A proper and real Muslim can be a da'i through becoming the role model. Ask any Muslim in the world, who is your role model? The answer would be, I cannot hear you. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. He's our role model, isn't he? I'm not looking at Bollywood. I'm not looking at the best cricketers or footballers. I'm looking at a real role model that can be the best 
of the best sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam if you look at his life he was the greatest ruler look at all the rulers in the world does anyone come close to his fingernail sallallahu alayhi wa sallam no no one can claim he was the best ruler he was the best leader he was the best judge he was the best imam not only on the political side with all my respect to our politicians but also on the social side he was the best husband he was the best father and he was the best companion to the all of his followers not to selected ones only so he is our role model which means that if you look at the Muslims, professional Muslims, when they become practicing Muslims, you will have results beyond your imagination. Look at Indonesia, 240 million Muslims, almost quarter of a billion. Look at Malaysia, look at Africa, not the north of it but the south of it all the muslim countries in south in, in in africa look at the muslims in europe and in america why did they accept islam not a single army not a single soldier went there they accepted islam because they had encountered merchants from muslim world they had encountered immigrants who migrated to their countries who were proper muslims Milibar, they say this area is called previously and Islam entered this region of India not by soldiers and by military actions or by merchants so to be a role model to behave as a Muslim 24 7 this calls people to Islam which means as a Muslim professional it is your responsibility it is your obligation not to lie a muslim does not lie sheikh we have hundreds of millions of muslims lying yes yes they are muslims but they're not practicing muslims they are not real muslims a true muslim a true believer wallahi does not lie they do not cheat so as a Muslim professional, you cannot cheat. Sheikh, my grades are not good. I have to cheat in examination. Only this one. And it's only six examinations. Only this semester. And I get a lot of questions like this. I'm studying medicine. And I have to cheat. I have to give money to the professor so that he can make me pass the exam. I need the money. My family is poor. If you cheat, your income is haram. Your salary is haram. And you and are you cheating are not only the teacher or the professor or the university, you're cheating the, you're cheating the whole ummah. And before all of that, you're cheating Allah Azza wa Jal, who knows what you are doing. So a professional Muslim does not lie, does not cheat, and he's on the top in terms of courage, generosity, tolerance, and in ethics and moral conduct. I can tell that this is a Muslim brother by how he looks and also by how he behaves. Not by the topi. I only I know the brother, he's a Muslim by the, the, uh, the head uh, uh, where they put. No, no, not necessarily. You could have someone wearing this and he's not a true Muslim. He cheats, he lies, he does all these bad things. Part of your responsibilities as a professional Muslim is that you become a perfectionist that you perfect that you perfect everything you do and how would I do this as a Muslim professional you should be in top of everything you do so if you're in IT you always have to be updated you always have to attend conferences read material to your best to the best of your ability why because this is part of your duties as a Muslim even if you are not a professional a Muslim who works as a janitor 
You know what a gen janitor is? A person who cleans and sweeps the floor and cleans the bathrooms. If you're a Muslim doing this, you have to be a perfectionist. Even if you don't know how to read and write. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Allah the Almighty loves that when you do something, that you make it perfect. So it's not good to say that it's just a normal job. No, you have to excel in your profession. You have to excel in your job so that you do it perfectly. And part of doing it perfectly, that you have sincerity. You have ikhlas. So part of being a professional, that you do what you do for the sake of Allah. How does this translate into day-to-day -day jobs? Well, if you have a nine to five job and you go to work every day in the morning, do you go at nine exactly and leave at five exactly? Well, depends, Sheikh, because you know, people come 9.30, 10 o'clock and they leave at 3.30, 4 o'clock. Sometimes I ask my friend to sign on my behalf and I leave at 12 o'clock. And then you're not a good Muslim. A good Muslim always comes and goes in accordance to what he's paid for. Your contract with your company says that you work from 9 to 5. You should come before 9 and you should leave only after 5. Otherwise, what you're taking, your salary is not good. Also, you have to be sincere in your job. Eight hours. Are you work, working eight hours every day? He says, yeah, Sheikh, I answered the emails in 15 minutes in the beginning of the day. And then I start working on my own business. Telephone from the company, using company's fax, using company's Xerox. Is this halal for a Muslim? A lot of the people say, everybody's doing it. A Muslim professional is not like everybody. He is always on top. If people do well, he does well. And if people do bad, he does well. A lot of the Muslims don't do their jobs properly. Why? Everybody's not doing it. Why should I do it? See, you're different. You're not like them. You do what you do because you want barakah. You want the blessing. You want the approval and the pleasure of Allah to be upon you. So I excel in my job. And I do my best so that my religion becomes the best. I come early to the office or to the shop or to the administration where I work. Why? Because the Prophet says, May Allah bless for my ummah the early risers, the early birds. So whenever you start your day early, Allah will bless it. And if you start your day late, then you will be deprived from this blessing. One of the responsibilities of a professional Muslim is to maintain and to preserve public property. Unfortunately, where I come from, in Saudi Arabia, we are the land of Islam. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of that relating to Islam. In the sense that the Muslims, they're born Muslims. And unfortunately, they do not practice it properly, except those who Allah has guided. And Alhamdulillah, there are a lot who are practicing, but public property is being abused. So people, when they work in their offices, they do not respect that this is the property of the whole ummah, of the whole country. So they abuse their desks, their chairs, their bathrooms. You enter the bathrooms, it's the dirtiest on, in the world. Why is that? Our religion is a religion of purity and cleanliness. Why do we always enter a masjid and we find it filthy and dirty? This means that we are not practicing. That we are the fault in this. A Muslim always comes on top. If they do bad, you should do well. And that is why we have to focus on quality. It is not right to focus on how many attendees came to the lecture. 
but rather how many benefited it and how many started to change their lives to the best as professionals. Uh, one of the responsibilities of a Muslim professional is that he's not selfish. You do not become selfish in the sense that only me that matters and the rest may go to hell. No problem. This is wrong. A Muslim professional loves good to everyone and he shares his knowledge. He shares his work with everyone. Unlike those who are selfish, they say, no, this is mine. I will not share with you. I will not teach you. A Muslim, instead of feeding someone a fish every day, he'd rather teach him how to fish himself. And then he's self-sufficient. And this is very important. Don't think that if I teach my brothers something about administration or IT, that they will become my boss. Let them become my boss. I share my knowledge with everyone so that Allah would bless my knowledge for me and as I like people to help me, I would help others. And this is a sign of a true believer. A Muslim professional always attributes everything that he has and know to Allah Azza wa Jal. I worked as a teacher for 15 years in public schools and then worked in a multinational company as a public relation manager over almost 18 countries and then worked as a human resource director in a mining company so i have some corporate experience unfortunately whenever there is a meeting for a budget or for target review i see other colleagues when they make their presentation with a powerpoint they say i managed to achieve so and so for the company in the first quarter and i succeeded in doing this and that and preventing the company from uh, having losses and i will do this next year so and so and this is a serious crime this is a sin to attribute everything to yourself without favoring Allah Azza wa Jal, without saying that it is Allah who made it, this can be a major shirk or a minor shirk, depending on how you intend it. Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, said that when a man says that had it not been to this small dog, the burglar would have broken into my house and stole it. It's a normal statement. You're sleeping at night and the dog barks. And you look from the window and you see the burglars running away. They were trying to break into your house, but your neighbor's dog barked and they ran away. Ibn Abbas says, whoever says in the morning, Oh, if it weren't for this dog, the burglars would have broken in. Whoever says this, he has committed shirk. Why? Because the, you should have attributed it to Allah. Had it not for, had it not been for Allah Azza wa Jal, who made the dog bark, then the burglars would have broken into my house. So compare this to someone who says, I managed to achieve eight million dollars for my company and did this and did this and did this, attributing it to himself. No, always attribute everything that is good to your maker, Allah the Almighty, because you would not achieve anything without his help. Now all of you take a deep breath. Okay, one, two, three, take a deep breath. Now, if it weren't for Allah Azza wa Jal, you would not have taken that breath. When your time comes, Allah would say, no more breath, Khalas, you're dead. So whatever you do, always attribute it to Allah Azza wa Jal. He's favoring you by making you sit, walk, talk, study, read, learn. So as part of your responsibility, you must attribute this to his grace, to his favor, to his blessing over you. 
one of the attributes, and this is very important to all Muslims, but especially to the professional Muslims. One of the great attributes and responsibilities over a professional Muslim is humbleness, to be humble. Unfortunately, once you get the degree, once you get the ENG as a prefix to your name, what's your name? My name is Muhammad. Nobody says this. Everyone says, Engineer Muhammad, if you please. Don't call me Muhammad. My name is Engineer. My name is Dr. Abdullah. Your father called you Abdullah. He said, no, no. He was wrong. He didn't know that I will have a PhD. My name is Dr. Abdullah to you. You have to be humble. You have to be down to earth as a professional Muslim. Because the knowledge you possess, the more you possess, the more arrogant you get. So you have to drag yourself down to reality. Who are you? Once, there was a man who was a powerful leader in his tribe, making tawaf. You know tawaf. Professional Muslims, they don't know tawaf. Huh? Tawaf round the Kaaba. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that He gathers me and you in the Haram, making tawaf and supplicating and making Umrah with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he was going round the Kaaba, and his dress was too long. And you know that having the dress trousers, your uh, kandura huh? uh, below the uh, uh, the ankles, this is a sin, and it's punishable in hell. This man was doing tawaf with his dress behind him. And one man accidentally stepped on it. So if, when you're walking and somebody steps on your dress, you, you go backwards like this. So the man said, what are you, crazy? Don't you see? Don't you know who I am? And he was asking him while doing what? Tawaf in the holy city of Mecca, in the holy haram. What? What perfect place to be, yet he's arrogant. And the man says, yes, I know you. In the beginning, you were a dirty sperm. And at the moment, you have crap and uh, uh, defecation in your stomach that stinks. And when you die, you will end up as a stinking corpse. And the man immediately said, by Allah, you know me. And he became humble again. Because he knew reality. So, as a Muslim professional, you have to be humble. Arrogance is totally prohibited in Islam. It is one of the major sins in Islam. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, the man with an atom weight of arrogance in his heart will not enter paradise. A person with an, with an atom weight of arrogance in his heart will be deprived from entering paradise. How do you feel when someone comes to you, dirty, smelly, touching you, say, give me one rupee? Would you feel proud and saying, get away from me? You don't deserve to live. You don't know what I know. I'm a Muslim professional. MashaAllah, With this attitude, we'll end up as a Muslim professional in hell. Be humble because people would only accept from those who are humble. Now, being humble does not mean to be weak. Being humble does not mean if you walk in the street and somebody slaps you on the head, say, Zakallah khair. Another one here, please. No, this is not being humble. This is being stupid. Being humble is that you do not do zulm. You do not transgress over others. Being humble is that you do not have arrogance in you. Because the Prophet was asked when he said the previous hadith, you've heard, no one with an atom weight of arrogance in his heart would be or would be admitted to paradise. One stood up and said, O Prophet of Allah, as Muslims, we like to have beautiful and clean thobes, nice shoes, we like to look good. Does being humble mean means that does being humble mean that I have to look bad? Does arrogance mean that I have to look good? I like to be in shape. I like to have a good athletic body. I'd like to drive a fast, beautiful car. Is this haram in Islam? 
The prophet said no. This is not arrogance. Arrogance is looking down at people and depriving them from their rights. Transgressing. This is arrogance that is punishable in Islam. Part of the duties and responsibilities of a professional Muslim. A professional Muslim does not spread the secrets of the organization he's working. Muslims sometimes, especially nowadays with Twitter, with Facebook, with Keek, with all these social media networking, a lot of them, unfortunately, knowingly or unknowingly, they put their dirty laundry to everyone. Oh, my father said this and that to my mother. And the, you have like 100 comments. Oh, poor mother. And so, poor father and poor you. And he adds back, so stupid things. Now, in a Muslim professional's life, this is totally different. As Muslims, we're not allowed to expose secrets that we were entrusted with, especially in your organization. And the origin of this was in the Sunnah of the Prophet Anas ibn Malik was about 10 to 11 years old and he was serving the Prophet And you know Anas ibn Malik, right? Anyone knows Anas ibn Malik? Raise your hands. People are sleeping. I don't like people when they sleep. Raise your hands. Anas ibn Malik, who knows him? Professionals. MashaAllah. Only few. Anas ibn Malik was one of the greatest companions of the Prophet he was a child when he was brought by his mother to the Prophet and the mother said O Prophet of Allah keep my child with you he's very learned and he will serve you and he will not charge you anything she knew that the best thing that he could get is knowledge from the Prophet so he served the Prophet for 10 years and he was one of the great narrators of hadith you know his mother who knows Anas's mother's name? Raise your hands, please. La ilaha illallah. I think I have a problem with my eyesight. Only one brother there? You don't know your heritage? You don't know your ancestors? This is a big problem. And I always say this when I address the youth. Her name was Um Sulaim. Now I'm not going to ask you who were... Uh, who was her sister and who was her martyred brother and who was her husband because then we will lose the whole thing but this is a problem if i said what is the name of the top five cricketers in india you get it. what is the latest uh, movie of Shah Rukh Khan? everybody would know if i say yeah you have a problem the companions the 10 best companions of the Prophet Islam, who's the names? You will give me seven or, or, or six maybe. And the rest? I don't know. If we were to be admitted to paradise, Jannah, you will enter Jannah? MashaAllah, big crowd. Who's this? Abu Bakr. Oh, MashaAllah, who's Abu Bakr? Companion of the Prophet. Oh, MashaAllah, nice meeting you. This, Umar. Who's this? Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. And this one, Salam ibn al Akwa. Come on, you're kidding me. Who are these? I don't know anyone here, Akhi. Tell you what, let's go to hell. And if you go to hell, Masha Allah, Tabarakallah. I know everyone there. This is a problem. A Muslim attitude should not be like this. You should know your heritage, you should know your history, you should know everyone around you. Anyhow, going back to the topic, Anas bin Malik. May Allah be pleased with him. He was a servant of the Prophet. Once the Prophet came to him and he was playing with the boys on the street. Companions do play. Huh? So he told him, come. And he whispered something in his ear. And he told him, do what I tell you, do not tell anyone. So he went and did what he was told to do and came back. His mother saw him. And she said, where have you been? And... He said, I was doing something for the Prophet She said, what was it? He said, it is a secret. A 10 year old. What is the normal reaction of such a mother? You have to tell me what he said to you. Or I'm going to beat you until you die. No. 
This wise woman said, if it is a secret of the Prophet, do not disclose it to anyone. Now, a professional Muslim deals in the same fashion. Your company, your administration, your government has entrusted you with work. And they have entrusted you with this work that you do not expose it to anyone. You should learn how to conceal the secrets of your organization. And this is part of your responsibilities. Among the great responsibilities of a professional Muslim is to learn how to balance. Unfortunately, a lot of the A students, the excellent people who are doing hard in their jobs, in their schools, and they neglect the issue of balancing. And this is very important. As a Muslim professional, I can be one of the richest men in my country or at least one of the highest paid in my jobs. But this would mean that I have to jeopardize something else. That is why those who do not have the balance, they have a problem. You find businessmen, excellent in their jobs, excellent in their work, wealthy, successful. But when you come to their religious practicing and to their knowledge, they are not that good. If you come to the level of health, and doing cardio and, and, and going to the gym and taking care of themselves, you will not find them very successful. If you come to the social aspect, when did you see your uncle last? So, oh, seven years ago. Oh, subhanallah. You don't connect to the next of kin? Where does your uncle live? In another country? I said, no, next door. But you know, I'm busy meetings, traveling. I don't have time to see. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, he who does not connect to the next of kin, to his kinship, will not be entered or will not be admitted to paradise. It's a big problem. If you come to the social level, to the marital life, ask the wife, are you happy? She says, yes, I have two cars, two drivers, a big mansion, a summer uh, house, uh, six, seven membership in different clubs. I have jewelry, I have dresses, but I don't have a husband. Now, this is a big problem. So likewise with a professional, a lot of the sisters call me and send me emails. I've been married for seven years. I don't see my husband except for half an hour when he comes at 10 or 11 o'clock p.m. And on the weekend, I don't see him at all because he's always with his friends playing video games. Well, I haven't been getting this from sisters. Playing video games? Don't you have shame? Aren't you old for this? Playing video games? Yeah, go, go karting, go play billiards or golf, do something worthy of a man. Playing video games. So they're complaining. So the problem with the Muslim professionals that they don't have the balance. The Prophet ﷺ visited once Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. And I'm not going to ask you again who is he, who he is. But he visited him and he knew that he was a newlywed. His father visited his daughter-in-law after two, three weeks of marriage, of consummating the marriage. And he asked, how is Abdullah? And the woman is a decent Arab woman. She said, MashaAllah, he is a very good man. He fasts every day and he prays night prayer the whole night. So Amr ibn al-As understood. If a man fasts every day and he prays every night, when will he have time for his wife? When he will have intimacy with his wife he will not so she he understood that he doesn't sleep with her because of ibadah so the prophet came to him and told him alayhi salatu wasalam, these beautiful words your lord allah has rights over you your wife has rights over you your body your health has rights over you your guests Whoever come to you and spend the day with you have rights over you. So give each one his rights. This is the issue of balance. You have to have balance in your life. Maybe you cannot have it 100%. You have to have time to work efficiently. You have to have time to attend circles of knowledge and learn your deen. 
You have to have time to fast voluntary fasting, Monday, Thursdays, white days, etc. You have to have time to spend night prayers. This is something between you and Allah. You have to have time to go to the gym. Do your cardio, do your uh, weight training, do whatever you want. Play cricket, play football. You have to have time for social affairs. Your next of kin, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, your brothers, your sisters. And be kind to them. And call them, visit them, invite them, give them gifts. And you have to have rights with the friends you have, the associates, the people in your community. If you balance and manage this balance, you will be the most successful person on earth. I tell you. Because you will be the happiest man on earth. But if you, but if you don't, 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 if you spend if you so much time, time at work, at work and, and so much time pleasing your wife, your wife on the account, on account of your father and mother, you have a problem. And if you, and if you serve your father and mother on the account of your family, your wife and children, you have a problem. Diabetic businessmen, high blood pressure, uh, all kinds of high cholesterol levels, etc. All of these are not part of the responsibilities of a Muslim profession. I have like four minutes. How many minutes do I have? Four minutes? Five minutes? Four minutes more? Okay, so four more minutes. Okay, I will conclude inshallah. Yani, half an hour more inshallah. You're joking. Um, okay. Okay. Part of the responsibilities of a professional Muslim is to have wisdom. Hikmah. What is the meaning of hikmah in Islam? Hikmah is the knowledge of how to put things in the right position. So part of hikmah is that you know how to deal with things. Part of hikmah is that you know how to react. And what are the consequences of what you say? And of what you do. A lot of the Muslims don't have this hikmah. Unfortunately. And I'll tell you an example that maybe a lot of you would not like. If some newspaper writes something about our Prophet or make drawings, this is kufr. This is something unacceptable to Muslims. You have to react. Some or not some. The majority of Muslims would react in a negative way. They will demonstrate and demonstration in, in Islam is haram, is forbidden. They will break public property, they will loot, they will burn places, people will die, people will get injured. Why are you doing this? Oh, they insulted the Prophet But this is not wisdom, this is not hikmah. No matter what they say about our Prophet they cannot harm him. Every single area in the whole of earth, the Prophet is being mentioned when Allah is being mentioned. Whenever there is an adhan, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, you will always hear Ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul, Ashadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah. Every adhan, you will hear this. In America, in Denmark, in Norway, in Africa, in China, no spot, even in Siberia, even in the North uh, uh, Pole or the South Pole, the name of the Prophet is always exalted. So no matter what they do, it, they will not harm him. But now, if you're not wise, you will harm Islam through demonstration, through being angry. And there is all the right for you to be angry, but not to express your anger in something that is against Islam. So you have to know the consequences of your actions and judge them by the consequences and not by the beginning, but not by the reaction. And finally, a Muslim professional has red lines that he does not exceed. You do not go beyond. So you are a Muslim professional sister. Writes to me an email. I graduated and I got a job in this company, but they say I have to remove my hijab. Is this halal? Definitely not. Sheikh, but this is a necessity. No, it's not a necessity. There are red lines you cannot play with. They don't allow me to pray dhuhr on time. Leave the job. Tell them, I'm resigning. Oh, Sheikh, I need money. I need provision. My family is poor. We will die out of hunger. 
Akhi, who is the provider? Who is the provider? Huh? Allah, the Almighty. You know this? Yes. Then quit your job. Um, okay, then you don't know this. The provider is Allah Azza wa Jal. So seek his provisions. Don't say that, do, do not seek the paycheck from the people. Pay, seek it from Allah Azza wa Jal, who owns everything you see on this earth. A Muslim brother does not cross the red lines. You have to do this that goes against your religion. Sorry, I cannot. I refrain. Why? Because this is my religion. I can do anything you want that does not go against the Quran or against the Sunnah. You have to shave your beard. It's haram. If I, if I can shave my beard, wallahi, I use Gillette 3. Now, immediately I shave it in front of you. It is not halal. It is forbidden. It's a sin. Otherwise, I would have done it. So, there are red lines. You must not cross. Because if we practice Islam 100% with the spirit of Islam, to the letter of Islam, by Allah, this life of ours on earth would be different. Because Islam is compatible with every location on earth. It is compatible with every generation that has passed or yet will to come. And it is a source of happiness to the whole of humanity. If we practice it 100% 7 or 24-7. Our problem is that we practice Islam to our liking. The things we like, uh, this is good. I'll take this. And the things that are not good, I will leave it and not look into it. This is my talk to you. I apologize if I made some of you fall asleep or if I bored some of you to death. But inshallah, if you have the good intention, Allah Azza wa Jal would accept all of our deeds. Wallahu a'lam. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina Muhammad.